Good evening one and all. I welcome you all to Ganesh IAS Academy. In today's session, we will be seeing environment based current affairs from the date January 5th to 12th, 2024. Let us get into the news articles one by one. The first news that we are going to see is wetland city accreditation. So, what is this wetland city accreditation? Which body is giving this accreditation and it comes under which convention? And what are all the three important cities which has been selected for this, okay, which has been recommended for this. All these things we must have to understand. Let us get into the details. The Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has submitted three nominations from India for this wetland city accreditation. And those three cities are Indore of Madhya Pradesh, Bhopal of Madhya Pradesh and Udaipur of Rajasthan. Okay, so these are the three cities which has been nominated for wetland city accreditation under Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. So, here you must have to understand that this wetland city accreditation comes under Ramsar Convention of Wetlands. Okay, next, these are the first three Indian cities for which nominations have been submitted for this wetland city accreditation and this is based on the proposals received from the respective state wetlands authorities in collaboration with the municipal corporations of those cities. Okay, So, from here you must have to understand that this is on a voluntary basis. Okay, So, these nominations are done on voluntary basis. Okay. So, here the wetlands situated in and around these cities that is Indore, Bhopal and Udaipur provide a plethora of benefits to its citizens in terms of food, sorry, in terms of flood regulation, livelihood opportunities and recreational and cultural values. So, these wetlands are serving these purposes for the people who are living in that locality. Okay, so this is what we need to understand here. Now, let us get into the details of those three cities individually. Okay, Indore. Indore was founded by Holkers okay, of Maharashtra. Okay, Holkers were actually a part of Marathas. Okay, in Marathas, you will be studying this. Okay, so founded by Holkers. Indore is the cleanest city in India and the recipient of India's Smart City Award 2023 for its best sanitation, water and urban environment. Okay, so it is the cleanest city in India and it is also a recipient of India's Smart City Award 2023. Okay, and this Smart City Award was given for best sanitation, water and urban environment and there is a particular lake that is Sirpur Lake which is a Ramsar site in the city, in the indoor city and it has been recognized as an important site for water bird congregation. Okay, So, such water birds will congregate in that wetlands and then it is being developed as a bird sanctuary now. Okay, And a strong network of more than 200 wetland mitras is engaged in bird conservation and sensitizing local community to protect Saras cream. Okay, So, here we need to understand who are these wetland mitras. Wetland mitras are volunteers who are there for conservation and protection of wetlands in a particular location. So, those volunteers are called as wetland mitras. Next, the next city that we are going to discuss is Bhopal. So, it is yet another cleanest cities in India that has proposed conservation zones around the wetlands in its draft city development plan 2031. So, Bhopal in its city development plan has given importance to conservation of wetlands here and then there is a particular wetland that is Boj wetland of Bhopal. Okay? So, this Boj wetland is again a Ramsar site and it is the city's lifeline which is equipped with world class wetland interpretation center that is Jal Tharand. Okay? And then additionally the Bhopal Municipal Corporation has decided lake conservation, sorry it has a 
dedicated lake conservation cell and a network of more than 300 wetland mitras. There we saw 200 wetland mitras who are working for conservation of wetlands. Here in Bhopal, we have 300 wetland mitras. Okay. And even here, the focus is on the Saras crane here. Okay. The next city that we are going to discuss is Udaipur, which is located in Rajasthan. And it is the city surrounded by five major wetlands that is Pichola, Fateh Sagar, Rang Sagar, Swarup Sagar, and Dud Thalai. Okay. So, this is the Pichola Lake. Okay. So, these wetlands are an integral part of the city's culture and identity and they help in maintaining the city's microclimate and also provide a buffer from extreme events. Okay. So, they help in the city's microclimate and also provide a buffer for, I mean, a buffer from the extreme events that is happening like heat waves and other things are avoided because of such lakes. That is what we need to understand here. So, what is this wetland city accreditation? We saw that these three cities have been nominated for wetland city accreditation. So, but what is this accreditation and how is it done? Let us understand. So, recognizing the importance of wetlands in urban and peri-urban environments and also to take appropriate measures to conserve and protect these wetlands. The Ramsar Convention during its Conference of Party 12, which happened in the year 2015, has approved a voluntary wetland city accreditation. So, this is voluntary as mentioned before. Okay, So, it is a voluntary wetland city accreditation system under resolution 12.10, Okay, which recognizes cities which have taken exceptional steps to safeguard their urban wetlands. So, those cities which has taken exceptional steps to safeguard their urban wetlands will be accorded this status that is wetland city accreditation and then the wetland city accreditation scheme aims for further promotion or to further promote the conservation and wise use of urban and peri-urban wetlands as well as sustainable socio-economic benefits for the local people or the local community who are living there. So, this is what we need to understand about this particular topic that is wetland city accreditation. What are the three cities which has been nominated? This we need to know and what are all the importance of those cities with respect to wetland conservation. So, this is what we need to understand from this news article. The topic that we are going to discuss now is a natural pathogenic fungi to help save eucalyptus forest. So, here a natural pathogenic fungi is going to be used to save eucalyptus forest. From what? That we need to know. Let us get into the details. So, scientists have found a natural remedy to protect eucalyptus forest plantations from a pest. What is the pest called? eucalyptus snout beetle okay the pest here is eucalyptus snout beetle which is known to cause serious damage to eucalyptus plants so the researchers have managed to collect a naturally occurring pathogenic fungi so they have collected a naturally occurring pathogenic fungi and they have characterized it for what to turn it into a biopesticide. So, they are going to change this naturally occurring pathogenic fungi into a biopesticide. Sorry, pesticide. Why? For controlling these beetle population, that is eucalyptus snout beetle population. And then the fungi could be used to develop a biopesticide for sustainable forestry using integrated pest management. Okay. What else do we have to know about this fungi? So, Eucalyptus snout beetle. We must have to understand about the beetle first and then let us get into the details of how is this fungi is going to help. Okay. So, eucalyptus snout beetle, it is a leaf feeding beetle. So, they feed on the leaves of eucalyptus plants and then it is a major defoliator of eucalyptus. Okay. So, what is foliage here? The leaves spread is called as foliage. So, it is going to act as a defoliator here, which means shedding of leaves will happen because of 
infection caused due to these beetles okay and this is according to food and agriculture organization of united nations and this pest is indigenous to australia but it occurs in many countries throughout the world wherever you can see eucalyptus okay so wherever eucalyptus is grown you are able to see these eucalyptus snout beetle though it is indigenous to australia which means in other locations they are acting as an invasive species okay so the beetle feeds on leaves buds and shoots resulting in stunted growth of the plants okay so they feed on them that thus it is called as defoliator of eucalyptus and it can cause damage over vast area as it had a great flight capability so it is having a great flight capability moreover how it is getting transferred from one location to another then only it can become a alien species or invasive species right so it gets transferred with transport of the forest products so that is how the transfer is happening here so this is the beetle which got infected with the fungus or by the fungus okay so this is the fungus which kills the beetle and it acts as a bio pesticide so scientists developed the fungi by treating according to insecticidal activity and uvb radiation tolerance among many other parameters and they have done this to ensure that the recovered fungi they have extracted natural pathogenic fungi right so the recovered fungi must be suitable to produce bio insecticide and its mass production and commercialization this they have ensured next why do we have to give importance to save or to save eucalyptus plants that is because these eucalyptus forest are spread over 20 million hectares across the world and they are crucial material for paper pulp production so this is the reason why we are giving importance for safeguarding the eucalyptus trees here okay so it is a crucial material for paper pulp production and it requires biological and chemical methods to keep this eucalyptus snout beetle population under control okay so the measure that they have taken now is a biological measure okay bio pesticide with the help of fungi the topic that we are going to discuss now is green fuels alliance india so what is this green fuels alliance india who has initiated this let us get into the details denmark has announced its green fuels alliance initiative why to boost collaborative efforts between the two countries that is denmark and india in sustainable energy solution sector and also advance their joint global goal towards carbon neutrality okay so there are two goals here one is sustainable energy solution sector is given importance here next is to advance the global goal towards carbon neutrality so this initiative or this alliance is led by danish embassy and consulate general of denmark in india and it is a strategic initiative poised to play a pivotal role in advancing the green fuel sector including green hydrogen okay so this initiative or this alliance primary objective is to promote sustainable energy growth as we already saw in india okay by establishing an ecosystem that encourages collaboration among business government entities research institutions and financial stakeholders from both indian and danish sectors or from both indian and danish nations okay so this is what we need to know what else this alliance announcement comes at an opportune moment in history of india where india is taking a massive push towards achieving carbon neutrality by 2070 so this year you must have to remember that india has this target or aim of becoming carbon neutral by the year 2070 okay and then meanwhile denmark has stopped okay this is india's position or india's target what is 
Denmark's position and what are its other achievements in recent times. So Denmark has topped the global climate performance ranking for the year 2024 which was re recently released in December 2023 and then it is also on the path of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. So Denmark will be achieving carbon neutrality by 2050 this is their target and India 2070 okay and this alliance is demonstrative of activities under green strategies partnership which was signed between India and Denmark in the year 2020 which seek to meet the partner countries ambitious climate targets. So the focus of this green strategy partnership is strategic partnership is to seek I mean to meet the partner countries right? that is India and Denmark's ambitious climate targets. These are the climate targets that we have achieving carbon neutrality in 2070, achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Okay. So this is what we need to know about this particular topic that is Green Fuels Alliance India. The topic that we are going to discuss now is Trico line. What is Trico line? Let us understand. Indian Institute of Spice Research, okay, Indian Institute of Spices Research, which is located in Kodi Code, has developed a new granular lime based trichoderma formulation, which is a fungal biocontrol agent. So, this trichoderma formulation is a fungal biocontrol agent which are, which they have recently developed. So here we need to understand what is trichoderma and what is tricholine. Okay, then only it will be clear. So what is trichoderma? Trichoderma is a fungal biocontrol agent which is present in all soils naturally occurring. Okay, and they are opportunistic plant symbionts. So what does this mean? Opportunistic plant symbionts. It means it has the ability for several Trichoderma species to form mutualistic endophytic relationship. Okay, so that is called as opportunistic plant symbiont because they have mutualistic endophytic relationship with several plant species. So, what is endophytic relationship here? Those organisms will be living within the plant. Okay, so that is endophytic relationship. And what is tricholine here? We know what trichoderma that it is a fungal biocontrol agent which is naturally present in all soil. Okay. So what is tricholine here? Tricholine is an integration of trichoderma and lime into a single product thus making the application of these biocontrol agents easier for the farmers. Okay. So this is what we need to know about tricholine. What else? What is the significance of this tricholine? What is the significance of using tricholine? So it serves as a biopesticide and also a biofertilizer in crop production. So being a biopesticide, it promotes plant growth and shields crops from soil bone pathogens all in a single application. So in a single application, all the soil bone pathogens will be killed. Next is functioning as a biofertilizer. So it acts as a biofertilizer and a biopesticide. So functioning as a biofertilizer, this tricholine improves the physical condition of the soil, enhances secondary nutrients availability and boosts soil microbial activity. So these are the things which we need to know about this particular topic that is tricholine. The topic that we are going to discuss now is hog deer. What is this hog deer? Let us understand. In a significant discovery, the hog deer has been spotted for the first time at Rajaji Tiger Reserve. That is why it is in news. Now we have to understand in detail about this hog deer. Okay. So what is hog deer? It is a solitary creature, but sometimes it is spotted feeding in small groups in open fields when food there is plenty. Okay. So, for the most part of it, it is sedentary, okay. So, it does not move much, 
and then it does not migrate from one place to another it is sedentary okay so here the males of the hog deers tend to be territorial which means they will mark their territory with glandular sorry glandular segregations secretions okay and this specific i mean this species of hog deer exhibits sexual dimorphism which means the females are slightly smaller than the male and it lacks antlers so what is sexual dimorphism here sexual dimorphism is when an animal has different sexual features that is there that is fine apart from that if there are any other features which is going to distinct the male and the female then such features are called as sexual dimorphism okay so here in the picture if you see this is the male and this is the female female lacks antlers and it is comparatively smaller in size so if there is going to be change in the size the weight and then if there is going to be any other features which is present only in male such things are called as sexual dimorphism which distinguishes between the male and the female okay so this is sexual dimorphism which is seen in hog deer and such sexual dimorphism can be observed in many other species of animals okay and then hog deer's distribution where can we find hog deer it has a native geographic range throughout india including himalayan foothills and southeast asia so even in southeast asia you can find hog deer moreover humans have introduced free ranging population of this deer in sri lanka australia united states including texas florida and hawaii okay so in all these locations you can find hog deer about its habitat it appears to prefer dense forest these hog deer appears to prefer dense forest because they do not migrate and they are sedentary animals so they need food plentiful food okay next they are often observed in grasslands and occasionally in wet grasslands also so they are found or they prefer dense forest but they are occasionally found in grasslands also so this change is there so this variation is usually associated with time of the year and food distribution so depending upon the time of the year that is season and the food distribution this variation is observed whether they are found in dense forest or they are found in the grasslands next coming to the conservation status of hog deer it is categorized under endangered category in iucn and then the wildlife protection act of 1972 under this act it is placed in schedule 1 which means it has been given highest priority okay for for its conservation the topic that we are going to discuss now is timor bestia what is this timor bestia let us get into the details the fossils of a new group of early carnivorous worms so these timor bestia are early carnivorous worms have been discovered the fossils of these worms have been discovered in north greenland and they have been made, named timor bestia meaning terror beasts in latin okay so they are also called as terror beasts so the fossilized animals which were found in the early cambrian Cirrhosis passet fossil locality may have been some of the earliest carnivorous animals to colonize so sorry to colonize the water column more than 518 million years ago so they lived 518 million years ago so here we saw that this locality or this site is an early cambrian site what does that mean what is cambrian here cambrian period is the first geological period of the paleozoic era that we need to know here and then this timor bestia is a distant but a close relative of living arrow worms so at present we have this living arrow worms these living arrow worms are a close relative of this timor bestia which lived 5008 sorry 518 million years ago okay and these living worms are also called as chetognaths okay so 
those living arrow worms are much smaller ocean predators so these arrow worms are also ocean predators just like these timor bestia and today they feed on tiny zooplankton whereas these timor bestia were bigger in size when compared to them but they are related so this was the fossil which was found and this is a diagram of that fossil so this timor bestia were giants of their day and would have been close to top of the food chain so they might have been the top predators of their food chain okay so this makes it equivalent in importance to some of the top carnivores in modern ocean so this timor bestia is equated to modern carnivores in modern oceans that is sharks and seals these are the top predators of modern oceans and it is equated to timor bestia there okay so this is what we need to know about this particular topic that is timor bestia The topic that we are going to discuss now is Biligiri Rangaswamy Temple Tiger Reserve. So, what is this Biligiri Rangaswamy Tiger Reserve? Where is it located and why is it in news? Let us understand all the details. So, the Karnataka Forest Department recently started collecting green tax inside this tiger reserve. How much? Rupees 10 from two wheelers and rupees 20 from four wheelers. So, when these four wheelers and two wheelers enter the Biligiri Rangan hills through this tiger reserve, that is Biligiri Rangan temple tiger reserve, then they are charged this green tax. So, here we need to understand in detail about the tiger reserve here. So, it is located in the Chamaraja Nag, Nagar district of Karnataka state, and then it is a unique biogeographic habitat okay so it is a biogeographical habitat which is present in the middle of the bridge between the western ghats and eastern ghats okay so it is present in the middle of the bridge between western ghats and eastern ghats so this is where the biligiri rangan tiger reserve is located okay so the tiger reserve derives its name from biligiri which is the white rocky cliff of this Biligiri hills which has a temple of Lord Vishnu and here Lord Vishnu is locally known as Rangaswami that is the reason why it has got this name that is Biligiri Rangaswami temple tiger reserve okay and it was declared as a tiger reserve in the year 2011 okay what else about the vegetation of this tiger reserve and the fauna of this tiger reserve coming to the vegetation of this tiger reserve the forest of this tiger reserve are principally dry deciduous tribe. Okay, so they are dry deciduous forest and they are also interspersed with moist deciduous, semi evergreen, evergreen, and shola patches. Okay, so even shola patches are seen here. Shola patches are grasslands. Okay, predominantly they are grasslands with short heighted trees that is shola grassland or shola patches 